they want to license it badly. And uh, so Chrysler's trying to stuff it in a minivan. And they were trying, the EPA people were like, no, put it in a Durango, put it in a pickup. And they're like, no, if we can make this work in the minivan, the rest of the stuff's easy. See, now it's serious when they turn the big light on. Yeah. Oh, and the cool light behind you. Yeah. It's my aura light. See the car. <laughs> oh, WSJ.com, how the Detroit News sold its soul. Who wrote that? Well, I don't remember. Apparently I did. <laughs> <laughs> it was on the Pistons website last night. Holy moly, this is excellent. And it was because it was... Gawker owns, Gawker put it up on all of their sites, including Deadspin. Deadspin has sports stuff. The Pistons website has an automator that anything that mentions Detroit, and then it was on the Piston website. Mm -hmm. I hear that guy is out that Illich is back in. What? No. Really? No. But I was to say, speaking of ethics and Deadspin, <laughs> that'd, be, that'd be a nice little twist right there. Well, you know, it was 30 days, and then there was a seven day, and then there's been nothing. Huh. So I, I think it's... Uh, oh, you're talking about Elledge? Yeah, I think Gores might be I'm out. Sure anybody wants that team. Just a couple of years ago, they were great. Yeah, but everybody saw it coming. Well, at least we can talk about them being great. I sure wish we could say that about the Lions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the Lions. We will. We will. I know. I believe it. The Lions are going to be good. What does that good. say? Out there. Uh, John, how are you, who are you going to introduce first? Oh, well, as always. Go with Peter. Well, no, no. Mm -hmm. Between uh, our guests. We'll, st cool. we'll start with Sharon. For yours? Okay. <laughs> I'll put away the Blackberry. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, this show is whatever. Whatever you want. Okay, go. Well then. There we go. I'm a, I'm, it's hooked up now, so I just think it and it types <laughs> for me. <laughs> it's like... Uh, I, I left mine in the other room so that it can charge. It's like Dustin Hoffman and uh, I'm an excellent driver. <laughs> mm -hmm. Rain man. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Five, four, three, two, one. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone, passion for excellence. And by Chevrolet, the all new Chevrolet Cruise. Get used to more. Well, thanks for being back with us, folks. And as always, I'm joined by Mr. D. Lorenzo. John, how are you? I have I'm my baseball well. jacket on. I'm ready for the season. <laughs> you do have a baseball jacket on. Yes, I do. So you are ready for the season. It feels like spring out there right now. For five minutes until you look at next week's weather report. <laughs> yeah. When it will be in the upper 30s all week. Oh, yeah. I'll get my skis out again. And also joining us tonight, Sharon Turlup from the Wall Street Journal. Great having you here, Sharon. Thanks. Glad to be here. And so just so if anybody doesn't know, you cover exactly what for the journal? I cover mostly GM. So uh, I cover, uh, you know, kind of all auto industry issues, but we have quite a few reporters covering that. So uh, I cover, I stick to GM like glue. <laughs> <laughs> and back with us again, as he's been here a number of times, is Scott Burgess. And I can't say of the Detroit News because you're no longer there. And Scotty, you got to tell us what the hell is going on here. Um, I resigned. Uh, it was I officially resigned on. Uh, there was a couple of days involved in the resignation, and uh, as you thought about this, no. As I turned in a resignation, and then they, I talked to, with people at the paper, and then talked about it again, and then submitted it again on Wednesday. Um, the, uh, so they asked you not to resign. Yes. I mean, so that's why you resubmitted it. Yeah. And uh, the first of all, resigning in public is not nearly as much fun as you could imagine. 
and uh, I haven't enjoyed We'll get into that in a minute. I'm laughing in anticipation, <laughs> not at it. <laughs> but um, it's, uh, the paper and I disagreed on, on a matter of editing a story. Uh, it happened last Friday. Uh, uh, the Chrysler 200. The Chrysler 200 review. We uh, tore it up pretty good. Yeah. I, I, didn't I thought it was balanced. I mean, you said some good things about it, too. You can find good things in there. Right. Um, it deserved to be torn up. Come on. I, you know, I just refuse to accept the, the homers in this town who are just, oh, everything Chrysler does is great and everything. Blah, blah. The 200 sucks, okay? They refreshened a piece of shit. It's still a piece of shit. I don't care what they do. And your review is dead accurate. The, the thing is, and it really what came down on the basis of writing it, is when you compare that car with any other mid-sized car. It doesn't compare very well. The other car wins, yeah. and and so it's yes, I, it was very harsh. Um, the the is, thing, is that the harshest one you've ever written? No, uh, you can go back and look up my smart car review. <laughs> <laughs> that should fit in the dumpster, I think. Yeah, the lines of that one. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and so and there's lots of times, you know, I, I'm very guilty of giving backhand compliments to stuff, and uh, but uh, the the editing of it of the review was not ever a question of something that I would worry about. Uh, things are edited all the time. Uh, you could edit just for space that it doesn't fit on the physical page. Um, the, I, I quit because of the motivation behind the editing on this particular one. Now, of course, the word is that some um, dealer, Chrysler dealer, allegedly called in to complain? I've never heard it was a dealer. I've, oh. only, I've only heard it was an advertiser. Oh, an advertiser. And, okay. uh, and at the time, I think that the paper thought what they were doing was good, and this was a nice way to do it. Uh -huh. um, Chrysler I, advertises on that site. And I, um, they, they told me what to cut. I cut it. I went home and told my wife, I have to quit my job. And since then, it's been a very big mess. And now, I think everybody in this business has had an editor go at their copy, and no writer in the world likes somebody taking their copy, but this is obviously different for you. Well, the, the original story had already run. This uh -huh. was 36 hours later or so that uh, the, these changes came. Um, the, from what I've heard, what the paper has said, that they think that now that this has been handled incorrectly, that it was a mistake. Um, and I agree. That's uh, what they say. Are you agree? They say, they say that. That you agree. No, well, they say that it was a mistake, and I agree with them that oh, yeah, it was yeah. a mistake. Okay. I can't Just clarify that. News. Right. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and that's why I put in my resignation. I, I actually went up to the EPA on Monday, um, and that was my first stop, and it was because of the eco car. Yeah. And uh, I thought I might not have to write that story, but after going up there, I said, no, well, I still got to write about these guys. They didn't do anything wrong. Mm -hmm. And so right. that's where I you. filed the story uh -huh. and then submitted your resignation. Yes. So, I mean, if they're admitting a mistake, would you go back? I, I, I don't know because I, I keep getting, I see half statements. Mm -hmm. uh, because I, I think they've mishandled this, you know, totally. I mean, that, that's, that's my vantage point, and I'm not just saying it because you're sitting here on the show with us, but, uh, you know, that's a real issue, I think, in any kind of a publication is this church versus state, editorial versus sales, and or business side of things, and everybody who's ever been in editorial knows <laughs> right. we're the ones always under pressure. So... Uh, I think all of us have been through maybe not exactly the same kind of a situation you've been through because never in my career have I ever had anything changed on me based on what an advertiser said. I've had copy editors change things and had uh, them tone down stuff for me uh, or maybe explain it a little bit better than I had written but never had in my career something changed because of an advertiser. I've had tons of things changed. Um, and. Uh, that's all part of the process. I, I mean, uh, you mean in the normal in editorial the normal, process? Normal editorial process. Um, I, and I welcome. I've always welcomed people to go in and offer suggestions and let's say this differently. Let's talk about that. I mean, Sharon and I worked in the same newsroom, and you would say, "Does this sound good?" And you, no, uh, you know, or that's in bad taste, or that's in anything, and that happens all the time. But 
I think that once that paper goes to print, any changes that you're doing after that, uh, and we've changed stuff online before, and the only things that we've changed online before have been, uh, I mistook the Cummings diesel as a eight cylinder. Who would ever think a six seven is a six, straight six? Yeah. And I, I just, I, I was sloppy. So and for factual stuff, it gets Absolutely, and, right. and, and, and there's nothing wrong with that, mm -hmm. and, and you should do that. But in this case, you know, I, I disagree with the motivation. And but now, tell me if I'm not wrong. I went and looked at the site last night, looked at it again today, with your review in it. They've taken all the edits out. They, I mean, they, they put back what they took out. I, <laughs> some of that is because of the way the Detroit News Online does caching. Um, if you were to go through it the one way, it was all still the unedited version, but they haven't contacted me and said, that we've put the original story back. Well, like I said, I went there twice because I just wanted to, in fact, I saw some, uh, somebody in the comments on Jalopnik had suggested, they wrote something that wasn't very well written. I went, wait a minute, do they mean that the news put all the edits back in and uh, went to the site, searched your story, found it and was like, oh my gosh, all the stuff that was edited out via you know, Jalopnik having printed the original and showed what was taken out, uh, I was able to make that comparison and went again this morning and it's back in. You know, I, if I'm reading it right, the original is back on there. Yeah, n nobody has ever sent anything to me. And well, that's what I find very puzzling, why they would take the stand and then back off their own stand. So that's why uh, it, it's kind of weird. Well, at the end of the day, uh, you have to, I, I spoke with my brother today, and, and I'll, uh, I'll make this quick, but my brother, he pointed out a really good point, which is, why is it a big deal if somebody does the right thing? <laughs> That's and, a good question. And it really isn't a big deal, and I think that I did the right thing, and that's all I, that's all I have to go with, is uh, doing the right thing. And uh, I, I know that we want to talk about ethics, and that's what it comes down to. What is the right thing? If it feels wrong, then it's probably wrong, and you shouldn't do it. And if you, if, if you make changes to a story because you're being told to do it and it doesn't feel right, then you shouldn't do it. And I, and I, I take full blame there. I could have stood up right then. And I, I'll, I'll readily admit that when it's happening, you're like, oh shit, what am I supposed to do? I, I, I've got this great job. I've got, I've got a mortgage payment. I've got a really crappy economy to deal with. And so I, I, I delayed. Yeah, well, you took you made a real gutsy move, obviously, for exactly the reasons you just cited. Yeah, there was no other motivation behind it. It's that's why I did it. But one second, should I read Kurt's letter? Why not? You think it's okay? Okay, we got a letter in here uh, from one of the t uh, Toyota guys, in, you know, who we all deal with in the business, Kurt. Uh, Mackay Allister, who says, please take a few minutes to discuss Scott Burgess's resignation on tonight's show. Many people in the journalism and PR community, including myself, believe that the Detroit News was in error in their web editing of Scott's recent review. He's one of the best reviewers in the industry, and it's a shame that the news sacrificed journalistic integrity to assuage the grumbles of a supposed advertiser. And I think that's a, a real powerful statement. I really uh, applaud Kurt for writing that because here's the car company people coming and backing you up. And I mean, they want you to write exactly what you think. That's why you're doing what you're doing. It, 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 uh, we've all met people that don't, that they just put kid gl kids' gloves on and, and go through the motions. And you lose readers, and it becomes ineffective for the car maker to have that person even review a car. Why spend the time in a vehicle? And uh, uh, if you, you could be wrong, and you know, I, I don't see myself as being all-knowing by any means. And I've had plenty of email exchanges with readers where they don't like my review. And that's perfectly all right, too. Um, you know, it, it's hard to say your opinion is wrong. Uh, it could be misinformed. Um, and I think that nowadays so many cars are so good coming out of the blocks. Uh, you know, we really nitpick on stuff. And uh, so, I mean, when I, whatever review you read or who's, when you put them together, I think that you can get a consensus of what's a good vehicle and what's a bad vehicle. If all of us talk about the 200, 
and none of us are going, well, it's really great, and I can't wait to buy mine. Um, I think that, that you know, there's the truth through consensus. Sure, and it seems to me the journal probably really keeps this church and state separation. At least that's my impression. Yeah, and I mean, I think the distinction that Scott's drawing is an important one. It's when do you, you know, the, what you edit before it shows up in the paper is a whole different ballgame between, what, you know, in terms of what you edit after it shows up. And I think that's the real difference. And, you know, it is, I mean, there's, it's a, it is new territory with, you know, with online and with the fact that we can change things quickly. We just don't have an option with the paper. Um, you know, as far as, you know, as far as it goes with us, we change factual errors online. We, tr we generally will, you know, run a correction and say, you know, this story's been changed. Um, but we definitely get pressure. Um, I ran a story that, uh, that had to do with a, a politician who was, who was not a friend of the Detroit automakers and got quite popular in not being a friend of the Detroit automakers. But uh, he, in an interview, he said, you know, I think the bailout, he said positive things about the bailout and it ended up running shortly before the election. And so they called that day just, you know, demanding that it be altered, that that, that story get, you know, get altered online. And, and they, they pushed all the way to New York. I mean, but the decision was that, you know, we can't just, you know, we can't open the door to just kind of changing things and fudging things once they've already run in the paper. And if it was, it was, if it was true enough to run in print, then it has to be true enough to, to run online. So, um, That's you know, a great point. But yeah, and I think, um, you know, of course there's always, it's, uh, you know, I mean, papers get put out on deadline, there's a rush. I mean, it can, I can understand the urge to say, well, we want to do things, you know, better now that we have more time, but I think it's really dicey territory and, and the motivations are important and, and um, you know, and that's, you know, it's, it's just, it's not an easy situation. So Peter, you've been on the advertising side. You're, you're probably clubbing these editorial types. <laughs> you know, I want to resign every other week from out of stream. <laughs> I keep sending my resignation letter back. Yeah, I've been on both sides. I've been, um, you know, I respect what Scott did. I think it was the right thing to do. Uh, absolutely. Um, I think the news was wrong. You know, you're always going to get pressure from advertisers. I'm in a different situation now, but when I was in the agency business, I was on that other side of that. But um, now I just get hate mail on a regular basis from disgruntled PR directors that happen to be hard down by the Detroit River, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it, it's also the, 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 the changing or the evolution we see of the media itself. Um, yeah, it's there's everything all the time. And it's all there's lots and lots of startups. Newspapers do not have the money that they. The Detroit News certainly doesn't. Um, and you know, I mean, even 20 years ago, the newspapers just printed money, and so they right. could pay for everything they wanted to do. Right. And there's very few publications, and I think that's bad for readers and consumers if we only have the Wall Street Journal's point of view because they're the only one that's Wall Street Journal and USA Today and a couple other big newspapers because they're the only ones that have the money to, to buy ethical behavior. No, that's a really good point because uh, when you look at uh, what's going on in terms of, well, hold on a second, we've, we're, we've got some people in here shooting some things right now. But yeah, what, what is ethical when you're a journalist covering this business? Because the car companies launch their cars at these beautiful resorts in all different places in the world, you know, and I know you guys, certainly at the Wall Street Journal, Sharon, you've got pretty good travel and expense budget. I've never been at a magazine or a publication that had the kind of budget to do what you're talking about, of paying for the editorial staff to be able to go and travel to these places. So you have to go, if you really want to go and cover these cars, if you don't have the budget, you're, you're on the, the car company's dime. And so that gets into a whole nother ethical area because do you take the car company's money to go do that or do you not cover it and let all your competition go do it and you know you can only do that for so long and then you're out of business. So. It, it, it's a it's a very funny kind of business in that sort of sense, in that there's not clear ethical lines, and you've got to draw your own, I think, because what works in one area definitely doesn't work in another. I, I'll give you a good example of that. Uh, earlier in my career, I was at, with ABC, and they, they started this whole thing where, okay, if anybody takes you to a lunch, 
uh, they can't spend more than fifty dollars on that lunch. Other than that, you know, then they're like buying you off. And you know, I, I started to say, well, well, wait a minute, this is twenty years ago. So a fifty dollar lunch twenty years ago was very different than what it was today. But the rule still applies because I said, you know, this was a meeting in New York. I said, for you guys in New York, $50 is not much to get by on lunch. I said, in Detroit, 50, I'll take my staff to lunch. We'll go to a great restaurant. We'll have a great time. So, and besides, what if the bill came to $50.25? Am I suddenly unethical? And, and that's what I'm getting into here is, as an automotive journalist, where do you start to draw the ethical line? And I, I think it's, it's totally blurry and it's, uh, probably unlike just about any other business. I, I don't know if that's true. I think that it's the, the political reporters that do all of those different things and go to all those dinners and, and you know, uh, the White House Correspondents Dinner that they just had recently and uh, were they sponsored for the table that they went to and were, who was the sponsor for the table that they went to. And, you know, I mean, Ultimately, your ethics, and I think auto journalists have to deal with this, or, or is what's inside you? What are you going to do? Is it's your inner barometer? Yeah, and right. if, that, that's the gr best way to put it, Peter. If it goes off, you got to say, "Hold on a second. And if it's not, and it should be, you you should probably ask yourself, "Wait a second. This is this is not right." And uh, I mean, wasn't there a Supreme Court judge talking about obscenity? I don't know what it is, you know, I don't know, what, I can't define it exactly, but I know it when I, when see, I see it. it right. And I, art critics have said that too. <laughs> I, I don't know if art critics said that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you should know. And if you know, and you have that pitted feeling in your stomach, and you go, this is not right, then you should stop. That's right. You know, uh, I had the original idea for Out Extremist in 86. It was going to be a car magazine that didn't take any advertising. It was going to be just hardcore enthusiasts. We'll say whatever we want to say because we wouldn't be beholden. You know, so I started at, what, 99. And I still don't get, you know, occasionally we do reviews in Out Extremist. Not very often because we don't get cars because a lot of manufacturers will not let me near their cars, BMW in particular. But that, I know why that, that's a little, goes back to a personal thing. Um, but I can't get BMWs and I occasionally get interesting stuff to drive, but you know, they don't like what I write, so they're not gonna give me their vehicles, which, you know, but in today's business, you know, if someone's gonna send me a car or truck to drive, yeah, I'm gonna drive it. I mean, I put, I put gas in it before I give it back, mm -hmm. usually. And, you know, that's my, but I'm somewhat dependent if they want to give me something to drive. Otherwise, I'm not going to write about it. Or what we've done before is we've gone and borrowed them from people who have them. And then uh -huh. that really pisses the manufacturers <laughs> off. <laughs> well, wait a minute. We could have controlled that. Control what? Yeah. He went and got a car from someone, and I, you know. That's right. Well, what if the manufacturer sets something up at, uh, uh, Silver Lake, and you're going to take the Ford Raptor and jump the first dune, and they pay your admission to that, and they've put the gas in the car, and they've trailered a truck all the way over there, and uh, do all of those things. And but if they don't, they don't get it reviewed. Right, and you don't right. get that photo, and you don't right. get the things yeah. that'll help help your publication. Sure. And you know, if they bought an ad in your paper and paid ten thousand dollars for the ad and got a front page story and it only costs $4,000 from the ad side, that's plus and not including the fact that you got people in the vehicle and you got opinions. They take a big risk. Every time they give you a car, it, they take a risk that you're gonna come back and say, this car's a dud. Way back in the 50s, uh, and I only, from, from hearsay, I think it's for you to talk about. General Motors was upset with the Wall Street Journal about a story in the mid 50s. I'm guessing 50s, well, 57 or 8. They ran a spy photo, as I remember. Yeah, and GM pulled all their advertising. All their advertising. And, you know, I, my, I That's think. That's a famous case. I think my, it was either right before my dad took over PR or right after. But he argued vehemently, what are you doing? 
do not do this. This right. is just the wrong thing to do. And so they made up, and but that was the first publicized case of that. Well, I remember uh, when Road and Track would assemble its annual list of the best cars. This goes back to, I want to say, 1991, 1992. There was not a Lexus on the list, and Lexus hit the roof and pulled all their advertising because they hadn't made this best list. Yeah. And uh, the next year there was a Lexus on the list, and I'm not saying that that's why the magazine did it. I mean, Lexus makes good cars, but the point is they did pull their advertising for the year, and uh, that can really hurt uh, a magazine financially, big advertiser like that. Well, it's, it's happened in recent years. There's been dust-ups. I think, I'm sure Gene Jennings will, has Well, there's always dust-ups. Yeah. There always is. But for a client to yank its advertising, that's a, that's a pretty big move. But it's happened in recent years. It'll happen yeah. again. You, yeah. it, it, they do that and they get mad. And you, don't, you shouldn't advertise in the publication to think you're buying something. You should advertise in a pub publication because the advertising helps you sell whatever it is that you're advertising. The, the, the content is what draws people to read whatever it is. Uh -huh. And whether or not, I mean, the, the interesting thing is we make such big distinctions with advertising, readers don't. You know, I heard Meyer has something on sale. Yeah. And it's like a news story. And there's a full page ad, I, nobody wrote anything about Meyer. And uh, you know, they're always gonna threaten. Yeah. Hey, uh, we gotta take a, a quick break here for one of our sponsor messages. And we have to thank Bridgestone for its support of AutoLine After Hours. Check it out at BridgestoneTire.com. Uh, they've introduced their third generation of run-flat tires. And there's benefits on both sides of the equation in terms of benefits to automakers adapting run-flat and consumers as well. And uh, you can get more information about that, why there's those kinds of advantages, at BridgestoneTire.com. Was that an ad? Yeah, that's right. It, you bet it was an ad. <laughs> that's the only way they can get them on this show. And uh, Chip, who was that? Yeah, it is Channel 2. Channel 2. Two. Uh, you know, I sort of lost my train of thought that back there a, few, uh, a little bit ago because Channel 2 came in to shoot the show that you're on the show talking about all this stuff. And uh, so that's when I looked up and said, oh, there's, there's a guy with a camera there. It, and I, I, I do want to clarify, I'm on here tonight because I gave my word I'd be on it a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, not way before all this happened. Not way, not yeah, 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 right, right, not to. I was hoping that Sharon and I would get a chance to talk, you know, about GM's cars. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about Lieutenant Dan. <laughs> <laughs> Although, on the, on the ethics point, I've been specifically, I've been intentionally quiet because I feel like, to your point earlier, that, you know, the journal's in a different position. I mean, we, you know, it's a, it's a media conglomerate. Uh, Detroit, you know, GM was running ads on our front page while we were writing that they were going to go bankrupt. So I mean, I'm like very aware of the fact that that we have luxuries that, you know, I mean, we we pay we can pay for our cars, we can pay for the trips. And I also know what it's like to not be in that position. And it's not an easy one. But I think the idea that, you know, advertising is the only kind of ethical dilemma in journalism. I mean, because while they can't control, you know, while advertisers may not pull ads, I think there's as much of an ethical dilemma presented with things like uh, source access and executive access and will we talk to you, will we not talk to you, will you get this information? And I'd be less concerned about reporters who, you know, who are soft on companies because they drove their car for a week than reporters who are careful about companies because they don't want to lose access to, you know, a certain executive, you know, or, or something like that. And I think that's, you know, I think that's almost, you know, as bigger or bigger of an ethical problem as the, you know, the advertising line is. Oh, interesting distinction. Real interesting. I've, you know, I've turned down access. You know, I remember Selen Bingo asked me, do you want to meet with Ed Whitaker? I said, no, no interest. Well, it, if yeah. all the... And it didn't matter in the long run, Peter, because no. you knew he wasn't going to be I, here. He wasn't going to be there. It was just like a cup of coffee, you know. <laughs> Sorry, it, Scott. If, if all the executives are in Geneva and GM offers you a chance to go to Geneva... Why would you not go? Why would you not go? And, you know, I mean, it, 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 it's part of this business. And, you know, they, they do all kinds of things all over the place. And you want to try to go and be there for the official unveiling because that will generate more traffic to your website and that will do the, the things that you want. So 
if you don't go, you're behind. Right. And you know, you know the drill, or I know the drill. If you get invited on something like that, you make sure you go to at least one of their dinners, go to their press conference, and then you're free to do whatever you want. And they know that's the gig. They got you to go, you know, to their dinner and make sure you attend their press conference. And usually they'll make their executives available, and that's worthwhile too. But they know the drill. If they're going to bring a journalist to an auto show, most of the automakers are pretty good at knowing. These people got to go out and fan out over the floor and go look at everything and other competitors. That's, that's just how it works. So that's the interesting part, as, as I was getting at before, is, yeah, we take these trips, but part of the deal is the car companies know they're paying our way to go report on other companies as well. And you get, uh, say it's a GM trip that GM sent you, and you're sitting down to, with Mark Royce, and Mark Royce says, yeah, the cruise is a failure, and we're going to have to redo everything. You write that story. It's not like they cancel your ticket and say, you know, you can never go you on. And hitchhike home. Yeah, I, I, I mean, it, if you feel beholden to them, then you're already in a bad place. And, and if you feel obligated to write something nice about anybody, um, but it gets back to what you were mentioning, Sharon. You don't want to lose that access. Yeah, and so. I think it's even things that can be more subtle. Like, you know, I think there's been, I don't, I don't know that they, you know, there's been certainly many a colorful auto executive who, you know, on the kind of casual part of a ride and drive, which, you know, I don't go on anymore, um, you know, but might, you know, might say, might crack a joke or might say something that would, you know, if you could write a story about it, a lot of people would read it. The guy would get in, you know, or gal would get in trouble, but nobody does that because nobody wants to be the jerk who, you know, who called out the executive who, and I, you know, so I think there's a lot of stuff that just kind of, you know, can go under the radar. I mean, I think that's why a lot of the blogs are great. And a lot, you know, the, the kind of the, the people who are less, I mean, part of it is, you know, some of the stuff that doesn't rise to the level of things you would report in a story in the Detroit News or in the Wall Street Journal. But, um, you know, I think the things that people don't get called out on, you know, how much of that is because it's not news and how much of that is because because nobody wants to be blacklisted for being the one who says something. Yeah, but then it depends, too, because, you know, my friend and you know, former colleague uh, uh, Jerry Flint was great at just yeah. excoriating people. And, you know, they, he would drive executives up the wall, but they'd still invite him to trips and press conferences because they had respect for him. And I think getting to your point there, Sharon, is that once you feel like you're beholden, like, oh, I don't want to miss going to all these beautiful resorts and getting all these trips and you're having the car. Once you're worried about that, it's the same thing as what you're talking about. Oh, I don't want to lose access to these these executives. It's just not a different level. Well, it's just as bad as advertising issues. I mean, you know, you just have to be good enough and be indispensable enough and you have to let them know that you're going to get the information whether they talk to you or not you know and and if you can't do that then plus access can sometimes be overrated mm -hmm. if they're always on you know mm -hmm. they're always like uh, well I can't I'm not going to say that or they will be so politically correct the whole time it's just like really I came all the way over here to to have this kind of conversation <laughs> it was not worth it you know but you know everyone wants that you're right, off the cuff comment. Um. Well, look, you know, uh, I, I'm sure we've all had that where you get that access with them, and especially it's like a dinner, or you're having drinks afterwards, and they get to relax a little bit. You get to really get to know them. They may say things on the understanding or even the specific, you know, verbal comment that this is off the record or background, or you let them know at some point, look, I'm just here. To, you know, we're, we're just people now. We're, we're off the job. We're after hours, it's right? It's too bad a lot of that's gone away. Um, I remember uh, GM would have a suite at the Chicago Auto Show where there was an open bar and an, a constant poker game over the two or three days. And, you know, my dad was running GMPR back then. And it was just like, that's that's was GM suite, and that's what you did. And anyone could go, and you smoke cigars, play poker. No one reported anything, because everyone looked forward to going to the Chicago show, to the GM suite, so that they could... Let their hair out. down a bit. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think the downside of that is when you, when the reporter side takes those things for granted. I think the plus side is... If you understand a story, that you can then write a story that is meaningful to your readers. And if you have an idea of who the people are 
um, beyond just the figurehead that blurts out whatever it is they blurt out. Um, and I also think that the, those relationships, um, there's plenty of things that people have told me that is off the record that I've never reported, I've never been able to put anything in the paper. Um, that doesn't stop you from trying and, uh, and it, you know, you just continue to do it. But I think that by understanding it and, and one, being respectful of those things, that it makes a huge difference. Well, it makes a, uh, yeah, like you say, a huge difference because it can give you understanding on what you then do report on. So even if you don't spill your guts directly on what they told you, you can say, this is happening and take these and those other things into consideration. I, I, I mean, I, 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 one example I can think of is, um, recently I wrote a review about the Chrysler 200. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the day before, <laughs> I called Chrysler PR, the people I know over there, told them that the review was running, that it was not going to be that favorable. I wasn't asking for suggestions. No one would ever, if they know me, they know they're not going to get a suggestion. And I am telling them this so they can alert their executive staff. I consider that a professional courtesy. Um, that you know that they are supplying you with a car and uh, and so and you you just do that and I, and I think that that dampens the the point of people getting really upset because they're already upset when they're open in a paper and then they go well it's not that bad and and then they go online and it's even less bad yeah well it is a professional courtesy because I'm sure any PR person would say they'd rather learn about it before their boss does. Well, I, yeah, don't surprise people. And, you know, I mean, there's going to be times when you do it. But, I mean, Sharon has written really tough stories. Everybody's aware of what the story is. Our job is not to get you. It's not to, to, to have this big blowout in the paper. Uh, you, your, your, your job is to, to serve your readers. And to serve your readers, you, you need to be able to present that stuff fairly and honestly and openly. Speaking of advertising, John, do we have another ad to do? <laughs> As a matter of fact, I thought we so. do. So I want to take a minute and thank Chevrolet for its support of AutoLine After Hours. Check this out at Chevrolet.com slash cruise. You know, with that Ecotech engine, uh, it offers pretty good fuel economy. In fact, what they like to point out is uh, it gets better than fuel economy of a number of cars in its class. Offers USB ports for your iPod, 40 gig hard drive, steering wheel mounted audio controls, Bluetooth connectivity, and a whole bunch of other stuff. Check it out at chevrolet.com slash cruise and that's C-R-U-Z-E. And uh, you know, this might just be a good time to get into rapid fire anyway. Yeah. Ben, let's bring up that graphic this is and get into it. Ever. Other <laughs> Okay, here. Oh, boy, we got all kinds of them just pouring in right now. Let's see what goes. Let, hey, Ben, I see we got a phone call there. Why don't we bring in a phone call right off the top? Well, uh, this is Ronnie Schreiber from uh, Oak Park, Michigan. I write for uh, uh, CTAC and my own site, Cars in Depth. Um, the, um, in general, there's a question about access. I mean, there's all sorts of ethical things. We get access to people that the, the general public don't get access to. We get access to events that the general public don't get access to. And, and, the, and the question is, it's ultimately up to yourself. Are, 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 are you going to be bought off by a lunch, or are you not? Um, I don't think a lunch is going to buy me off. Um, as long as I disclaim to my readers what the, um, you know, who has given me what, and they understand what the biases are, I, I, I leave it to my readers to be intelligent. Lunch in Maui. <laughs> <laughs> that really wasn't a question. Yeah. We got another phone call, Ben? Yeah. Well, here we got uh, one from John J.T. Thompson, the president of Event Solutions International. He says, I've often felt conflicted about what we do. Is it all a big sham or do we do the right thing for the consumer? Scott has taken the high road on this issue and he is right in this case. I am humbled by his integrity. Actually, I'm amazed by it. Pretty good. 
Uh, well, we should point out who ESI is. Mm-hmm. Well, go ahead. Isn't that the uh, the company that distributes cars away from me? Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> there are, several, know, right? there are <laughs> several companies out there who help these manufacturers, you know, prepare, store, deliver the cars to the media, pick them up. You know, it's a, it's a basic logistical nightmare, but right. that's one of the things that company does. Youngblood from Cleveland says, Mr. Burgess, congratulations on sticking up for something you know way down deep in your heart is right. Many years ago, I gave up a, car- a career in law enforcement because I wasn't politically correct. It hurt for a long time, but I know I am a better person for it. And uh, so I have extra bedrooms in my Cleveland home. You're welcome, carte blanche. Gotta go, there's still some green beer to drink. (laughs) That's right, it's St. Patty's Day. Oh my God, we forgot to mention that. Uh, Let's see, comment from Tony. Scott, what if Chrysler tried to hire you now to evaluate their vehicles internally, just like Bob Lutz hired some former journalists at GM? Would you take the job? I, I think that would be the wrong message. Um, no, I, I, I don't think I, I would, but I, I would like to say I have been absolutely blown away by the amount of support so many people have given me. Car makers, people that I've not said the nicest thing about all their vehicles, um, have been have gone out of their way to just send me their support, and they just say, is there anything we can do to help? And I don't know what I'm doing at this point. Okay, this has got nothing to do with what we've been talking about. Steve wants to know, (laughs) is the Nissan Leaf overstretching the range given the fallout that most owners say is closer to 50 to 70 miles, not the 100 plus miles? Well, I would say, you know, everything that you're reading about the Leaf of recent time has been in super cold weather by and large, and that really knocks down the range of an electric car. Yes, really. Your mileage may vary, especially if it's (laughs) ten degrees out. And you want to have heat in the car, yeah, or listen to the radio. You put the heat on, you can see the. (laughs) Uh, Let's see. Comment from Jim: In a former AMC Renault Jeep dealer Dodge, uh, built in the '60s, there's now a sign stating that coming soon Fiat of Tyson's. I don't know. Uh, I don't think this is well written. I can't understand it. Uh, comment from Jeff W. Does Scott think his review would have been edited if he had short hair? <laughs> I may have to get my hair cut, which is one of the things that I do worry about. Comment from Right Night. Why not do a car with a large springs energy to move it? <laughs> Right night that was tried in 1903. It don't work. 007 Mitch W says, J.D. Power just came out with reliability figures for cars. Why do some cars like Mini do so well in the market, both retail and used, yet fall apart? Well, because these days you got to realize that even when uh, in the J.D. Power ratings, the worst cars I mean, it's not like thing years ago, you know, when cars really did fall apart. They're not that bad. And the other thing that you got to measure is things gone right. There's, there's a lot of ways to measure quality. Things gone wrong is one way. Things gone right is another. And for cars like the Mini, for a lot of buyers, they don't care if there's a few niggling problems. That'll get fixed, and then they love the car. So, and that's true of many other vehicles as well. Mario Pizzi says, my question is regarding the new Volvo V60. What are the chances that Volvo brings this fabulous car to the North American market? If not, why not? Well, Mr. Auto Critic, what do you think? Former. Former. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) I I like the V60. um, I don't know if it is planned on coming here. Yeah, I don't know. That's their their station wagon. Yeah. So, or one of their station wagons. If they can pull off, anybody can pull off wagons, it's Volvo. That's right. Michael wants to know, when Mark Royce says that customers will see a variety of Corvette models in the future, do you think that GM will ever configure a Corvette for a tall guy like me? Peter. What do you think, Peter? Uh, Probably not. (laughs) (laughs) That's safe. (laughs) Mark from the land of Oz. All right, a guy down under. He says, I have a new C6 Corvette, a 2010 Equinox, and a 2009 Focus, but... He worries about the 10% ethanol 
soon to be 15% or more. Uh, what is it doing to his beloved 1959 Corvette? Any thoughts? And he says, I visit AutoLine daily and enjoy AutoLine Detroit and after hours each week. Thanks for all the inside information. Um, you know, I, if you've been running gasoline in your 59 Corvette, and even though you say you're from Oz, does Oz run 10%? Does Australia have 10% ethanol? I don't know. I don't know. But anyway, in the United States, if you've been putting gasoline in your car for, I would say, the last 15 years, chances are you have already been running it on E10. Yeah. Because that's what the EPA mandated years ago for an oxygenate to really make the gas burn more cleanly. It's almost impossible to buy pure gasoline anymore. And that's been true for quite a while. Let's see, what else have Except we got? Except that station on Woodward that every summer sells racing pump gas. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, yeah. You would know. Yeah, that it's, is. Like, <laughs> it's like uh, six bucks a gallon or something. Okay, comment from Prius Stud. He says, hey, John, did you see the clean MPG forum post that Cruz got 72 MPGs on one guy's 15-mile commute? No, I don't believe that. Even though they're an advertiser and we thank them dearly, I don't believe 72 miles per gallon out of a cruise. He says, it's getting better than the EPA uh, mileage from everyone who tests it. Well, you know, look, there. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you park at the top of a hill and let the thing coast. Uh, there's tricks that you can play, but this guy's not going to drive that, that, that car for a week and get that kind of mileage. Uh, okay, here's one for you, Peter, I think. Comment from Tim. Tim, what's everyone's thoughts on Lieutenant Dan's latest move placing Straka as the CEO of Opal? Well, that was to prepare the other guy for bigger things, right? I don't know. Let's, let's go to the GM expert. Jerry, yes. what do you think? Well, I mean, I think... I think uh, Dan Ackerson has been clear that he wants, that, you know, that not that he thinks that the folks at Opal are doing a terrible job, but that, you know, there's problems there. He'd like They're to still see them. still losing money. They've been losing yeah, money for like years. He'd like them to be resolved quicker. Um, he's impatient. He used that word, uh, you know, and the guy, I mean, they, you know, and the guy they put in charge is known as being, you know, kind of an aggressive manager. So, um, but what do you make of all the turmoil at GM? I mean, there's a lot of management movement, a lot of people leaving the company, a lot of people getting shuffled around. A lot of people around. being moved around the company, yeah, a lot right. of people being gone around the company. You know, I think it's, a, I mean, I think it's it, it, going into the IPO. I mean, one of the big concerns about GM was it had an untested management team. It had, it had a team that hadn't worked together very much. So I think everybody would like to see, you know, a, a little bit more of a settled structure there. I'm sure GM would like to see a settled structure there. Um, I don't think they were really you know, wanting to lose their, their CFO right at this point, um, who resigned last week. Have and you seen Marianne Keller's comments? No, no. Oh, because I, we, you know, we've had her on the show. We're going to have to get her back on, and I've only seen some reports about it. But she's taken a pretty snarky uh, uh, attitude about all this change going on at GM. Like, that it's a, she seems to be suggesting that Ackerson doesn't have things under control. That's what I'm reading. Well, she's been reading the comments. odd extremist. There's no doubt about that. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, there's a new CEO. There's going to be new executives under the CEO. So, I mean, I, I don't think you know, a couple moves necessarily means 